My out-of-studio partner for today's program is Mike Gendron. Mike, thanks for joining me on today's program. Yes, Tom, it's good to be back with you. We are going through the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 15, and as we've said in past programs, it's so important for those who uh, have not read the Bible or thinking about (laughs) reading the Bible. You want to start with the Gospel of John. That lays out the Gospel pretty well. But when it comes to the theology of the Gospel, what it is, what you must believe in order to, to be saved, there's no book like the book of Romans. Picking up with verse 8, it begins, And now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now, Mike, I'm thinking about some listeners out there, and when they hear the term circumcision or uncircumcision, even groups referred to as those of the circumcision and those of the uncircumcision, what's Paul, the Apostle Paul, talking about here? What's his reference? Well, his reference is to the Jews. That was the sign of uh, the Jewish faith was circumcision. And so what Paul is saying here in verse 8 is that Christ made was made a minister to the Jews, and he did it for the purpose of the veracity of God's Word, the truth of God, that he might confirm the promises given to Israel's fathers, and that would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so... This, I think, for the unlearned Christian may come at as, as somewhat of a surprise is that God sent his son Jesus to minister first to the Jews. And, you know, we know that the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, and it wasn't until then that God extended mercy to the Gentiles. But first and foremost, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, that is, of the Jewish race. In fact, in Matthew fifteen twenty four. He said, I was not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When Jesus sent out the 70 in Matthew 10, he told them not to go the way of the Gentiles. And so the message of the gospel first had to go to the circumcision group, the Jewish people, Israel, the Israel of God. And so once that happened and once the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah, then God extended mercy to the Gentiles. Right. And all along throughout the Old Testament, this isn't new to the New Testament, although as you go through the New Testament, you, you can see that the the Jewish people had trouble <laughs> with this aspect of it. It was a, a mystery to them, although it shouldn't have been, it should have, Mike, because all nations were going to be blessed through the seed of Abraham. So all nations have to do with uh, non-Jews as well as, you know, the Jewish the Jewish race. That's right, and it's it's so important to know that after the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah, then God was glorified by extending mercy to the Gentiles. And of course, this is the best way to glorify the Lord is when we are recipients of God's mercy. Paul, in writing to the Romans, we know from the other chapters that we've read, 14, 13, and so on of Romans, that there were issues between the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews, and the Jews. These are those who profess to uh, come to the Lord, and yet they had to get along. So much of what's written in, in chapter, as I said, 13, 14, and 15, have to do with believers, but believers who are Jews and believers who, who were Gentiles and how they would interact with one another because they were coming from different perspectives. Certainly, the Gentiles, before they were uh, became believers, were pagans. They were into idol worship and so on. And, and the Jews, for the most part, were legalists. They looked to the law instead of faith, faith in Christ and so on. Picking up with verse 9, "...and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written... For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. So here we have really one people in Christ. We have Jews who now have become Christians, and we have Gentiles who have become Christians. That's right. Jesus Christ has made us all one. And I know you covered it last week, but... The whole theme of this context here is that with one voice, both Jew and Gentile, we might glorify our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are to have unity in the spirit. 
whether we be Jew or Gentile. With one voice, we are to glorify God. Verse 11, And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. And here we have a statement that, you know, as you said earlier, Mike, based on the scriptures, that God is not only the God of the Jews, but he's the God of the Gentiles as well. And that is the blessing that we have. So verse tw- verse 13. Tom, before you start on verse 13, just a note that's uh, quite intriguing. When Paul uses these writings from the Old Testament in verses 9 through 12, it's interesting that he uses a portion of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And there's a progression that is noted there. In the first, verse 9, mm-hmm. it's Christ himself giving praise unto God from among the Gentiles. And then in verse 10, it's both the Gentiles and the Jews giving praise. And then finally, it's just the Gentiles giving praise. So I thought that was real interesting to note that Paul is tying in, really, bits of the Old Testament together to give praise to our Lord. Right. Verse 13, Now the God of hope... Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Mike, one thing that I I think we should address here is the aspect of the law which the Jews brought in, because that has application today. Certainly you growing up Roman Catholic and and, uh, that was my background. It really was a, a, a form of legalism, of law. In the Roman Catholic Church, there are rules and regulations. I know the Code of Canon Law, for example, has 1,752 rules and regulations, many of those things affecting one's eternal destiny. There were obligations to go to Mass. There were obligations with regard to the sacraments and all these things, rituals, uh, the, the liturgy and so on, um, was very much, a, uh, very much like the legalism of Judaism. Well, Tom, you're so right, and, you know, I just love this verse, verse 13, because Paul talks about how the God of hope might fill us with joy and peace. And you and I both know as Catholics, we had no joy when we were under the burden of the law, all the laws that uh, Catholics had to follow. There was no peace. There was Mm -hmm. a, a constant awareness that we were breaking God's law and that we were going to be condemned for it. But now the God of hope has sent his only Son to set us free, not only from the power of sin, but also that which gives sin its power, which is the law. And so we have been set free by the truth of God's Word. And that's why we do this program, isn't it? Because it's our prayer that Catholics will know the truth, and the truth will set them free from this bondage that they're in. And they might, too, experience the joy and the peace that comes from knowing the God of hope. Right. And, Mike, that phrase right after with all joy and peace in believing. You know, there is a, a major difference here between what we now believe as evangelical Christians, we who uh, look to the Word of God as our authority, the inerrant Word of God also as our sufficiency. But the Word of God says more than 150 times that you are saved by faith, by believing, by putting your trust in Christ. And the reason for that is that's all we can do. We believe, as Bible-believing Christians, that Jesus paid the full penalty for our sins. And if he paid the penalty, if he paid it in full, and even beyond that, Mike, uh, as sinners, there's nothing we can do except pay the, the penalty ourselves unless somebody who was not a sinner paid that penalty completely for us. So how can you receive that? How can you... You can only receive it by putting your faith in him, by trusting in him for what he did and what he alone could do. So when it says, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The just shall live by faith. It's all putting our faith and trust in him. Now, Mike, that was very difficult for me when I first understood that that's what call them Protestants or evangelicals, that that's what others believed because I thought there was just so much that I needed to do. And why not? That's the way we were brought up, right, Mike? 
Well, that's true, Tom. And one of the problems that we had as Catholics, one of the problems that Catholics have today is they have many objects of faith. Catholics believe they have faith, but their faith is in different objects. Rather than faith in the God of hope, their faith is in their church, it's in their sacraments, it's in their priest that they believe are telling them the truth and dispensing salvation to them. Now, the only way to have joy and peace is making the God of hope the object of your faith. Faith comes from believing. And in Hebrews 11:1, 1, we remember faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Mm-hmm. When we place our hope in the God of hope, who can never lie, he can never break his promises, that's when we have joy and peace. But if we put our faith in man-made institutions, in man-made religions, and man-made traditions, then we can never have peace and joy because those are all fallible institutions. And not only do they change, Mike, but honestly, they're hopeless. They're a denial. They're a rejection of what Christ did for us, what he accomplished, and only he, and he alone. That's why when Jesus says in in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And that means anybody who wants to add anything onto that is rejecting the statement of Christ. Only he and he alone could pay the penalty for our sins. And he did. And Tom, we can't lose sight of the last phrase of this verse either. Paul talks about that you may abound in hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you and I know that we have faith in the God of hope? It's because we look back on our lives since the day of our justification, the day we were born again, the day we received the Holy Spirit, who gives us the power to say no to sin. We can look back on our lives and we can see that there has been a gradual progression of what is called sanctification, Mm -hmm. where we have put to death the evil deeds of the flesh, and we live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. We couldn't have done that in our own power. In fact, Tom, you and I both know as Catholics, we were constantly in the bondage of sin. We would constantly go back and confess the same sins. We had no power within us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And so Mm -hmm. now we have this hope because we have the Spirit's power in us to live a victorious life in Christ Jesus. As Catholics, we were taught that the power was going to come through the sacraments. The more we received the sacraments, the more we took of the Eucharist and so on, that that we would be empowered, that our lives would be transformed, that we would, you know, that sanctification process came through going through or uh, uh, receiving the sacraments. But there's a problem there. Not only did I not experience that, and you say you didn't experience it, and somebody could say, well, you guys just didn't receive the sacraments often enough. You didn't do what the church tells you to do. But, Mike, who receives the sacraments more than anyone? And the that's priest. the priests. But look at the scandal in the priesthood that's been, I mean, it's common knowledge. So if somebody who receives the Eucharist day after day after day, yet there is a scandal among those who do that, you'd have to say, no, the power is not in the sacrament. See, the, for us, the power is in the Holy Spirit. He is the one who enables us. That's to live right. the Christian and, life. And that is so evident, Tom, that the priests do not have that power of the Holy Spirit. It's because they believed a false gospel and their faith is in an object other than the God of hope. It's in ritualism. It's in sacraments. It's in things, not in him. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to thebereancall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our e-books are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in. And we hope you can join us again next week. 
Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24-7. Don't none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.